the consequence assessment methodology. A couple things to start with definitions up front. Um, this idea of, of consequences, whether it's loss of life or economic, right? We talk about direct versus indirect. Um, and we're going to talk about this a lot more uh, throughout this week, and then we'll have a presentation on it later this week. And it's something we've really focused on more over the last couple of years is, is understanding the, the direct impacts people coming in contact with the water getting washed away or in their structure getting washed away and dying and indirect <clears throat> you have a major flood event it causes disruptions to the electrical network so somebody that's not even in the flood or even near the flood power goes out they start a generator they have it inside and then they they get carbon monoxide poisoning and die right it's an indirect impact of that major event uh, loss of life. A couple uh, definitions. These are on the tests. Pay attention. Um, population at risk. That's anybody who starts in the inundated area or the area that gets inundated, right? So, if you draw your flood map and you lay that over all your your census or your your structure inventory, whoever lives in that area or, or started there is at risk. That's what we call the population at risk. Exposed or often also sometimes known as threatened, but we like to call this exposed. Those are the people that are still there when the water shows up. They're exposed to the flood. Um, fatality rate. <clears throat> the way we uh, apply fatality rates, it's really the percentage of people uh, that died. But how many of you are familiar with the reclamation approach, RSIM, for estimating loss of life? Right. So, if you were to just look at their uh, approach and look at their fatality rates and compare them to our fatality rates, you'd say, holy cow, those are way different. What's going on? Um, it's important to think about, but <clears throat> their fatality rates are applied to the population at risk. So, they have that whole evacuation component built into their fatality rates. Our fatality rates are applied to the exposed population. So. We do the evacuation component separate and then apply, apply the fatality rates to the exposed population. It's an important difference. Talked about this a little bit earlier. There's other consequences other than life loss that are important to us. Economic, environmental, cultural, um, critical infrastructure. Those are all <clears throat> significant and, and do lead to changes in how we do our risk characterization. Um, but the methods for those are pretty well established, um, well, at least for the economic one. And the environmental, the cultural ones, we go through some sort of qualitative understanding on those in many cases to, to figure out what those impacts are. But the focus of this is really going to be on, on life loss moving forward. So objectives. <clears throat> We're going to describe the essential elements for understanding potential loss of life, uh, discuss the importance of that scalability that we talked about earlier. Uh, I will introduce the indirect life loss concepts um, and discuss a little bit on uncertainty. So let's start with the essential elements. So the first one is how many people are exposed to the flooding and the way we think about that is by starting with the initial distribution of people that would be in harm's way from a flood event and then talk about the evacuation and how those people redistribute either horizontally or vertically. Um, uh, but that's the, uh, the first piece. And then how severe is the flooding? So depths, velocities, right? The kind of the traditional breach modeling, hydraulic modeling component. Next one, um, are people in a structure that can withstand the flooding? So people are, are there, we know, we have an idea of the depths and velocities. Are they in a five-story concrete building or are they in a mobile home? Are they in a vehicle, right? The difference in their likelihood of surviving is going to be quite a bit different depending on where they're located and what kind of structure they're in. And then this will the people exposed to the flooding die, that's where we talk about fatality rates. Okay, we have an idea of where they're located, what the depths and velocities are. Um, just because they get washed away, does that guarantee they're going to lose their life? 
Um, just because they're able to wade through the water, does that guarantee they're going to survive? No. So we've done a lot of research to gather a bunch of case histories of people exposed to different flooding conditions and be able to figure out the likelihood of them surviving those flood conditions. And then the, the last piece here is the potential for indirect life loss. Looking at this, which one of these do you think is the most difficult essential element to be able to capture? For us, it has been indirect. I'll just let you know on the, on the quiz if you're worried about it. There's no right answer on that, right? There, this is a, that one's not actually graded. But <clears throat> until we really started even thinking about indirect life loss, so ignore that last one, talking about those first five bullet, or four bullets there, um, as an engineer coming into this, we're really good at modeling and figuring out flood severity, talking about the physics of structures, and going through case histories to come up with fatality rates. It's very difficult. Um, but where we were getting all the questions from our leadership when we were trying to build the case for our estimates was when you're starting to talk about modeling human behavior and deciding what people are going to do when they're going to do it, that's where we had the biggest struggle convincing people we knew what we, talk, what we were talking about because we didn't know what we were talking about. Um, so that's, we hired some um, professors, Dr. Malay, Dr. Sorensen, who are really the ultimate experts in the nation, if not the world, on understanding why people do what they do during an emergency event. Got them both kind of out of semi-retirement to come help us out and learn about that. And I'll talk about that in a lot more detail. Um, tomorrow, but that's understanding the warning and evacuation timeline. Okay, <clears throat> and again, scalability. There's another way of looking at it. Um, <clears throat> level of analysis on the right there, the more detailed you get, the lower your uncertainty is, the more resources that are required. That's, so I'm gonna talk about, for each of these essential elements, a little bit of how you can approach that scalability. So this is going to be another kind of semi-case history. <clears throat> so for each one of these essential, essential elements, we're going to walk through um, what happened during a Teton Dam failure for these specific ones, just to give an example to kind of burn it into your brain what we're talking about. So starting with the initial distribution of people, um, and I'm going to let you read these so you don't have to listen to me talk that much more. Okay. Initial distribution, you just read that. What do you think, what pops out at you that really matters here when understanding initial distribution of people? They're outside the structures? They're outside. Daytime, lunchtime, Beautiful outside, day. sunny day. All right, good, all of those. So when you're starting to talk about the initial distribution, it matters if it's daytime, nighttime, might matter if it's weekend or weekday, there's summer, winter, a lot of that stuff could, could end up making a big difference. And they're outside and not inside might make a difference in how or if they can get a warning. So put yourself in that situation. Somebody shows up pounding on the door, says the dam upstream is, has burst, get out, it means your life. What would you do? You would just run. Nobody would like jump on their phone and be like, was that guy crazy? Is there something actually happening? Yeah. Um, so actually what he brought up was good. So <clears throat> we'll talk about this more tomorrow. How do you get a really effective warning? This is about as good as it gets. And the only thing that would have made it even better is if this person was dressed as what kind of authority? What do you think works best? Sure. Right, good. Have you heard this talk before? No. <laughs> that's right. Not as somebody from the Army Corps of Engineers, that's not going to help. Right? Um, police, yeah, but firemen really is, if that would be the, you, you got that trust right away um, that gets over a lot of those initial concerns. The idea that everybody's going to do something slightly different. Not everybody's just going to run out the door right away. Some people are going to move important stuff upstairs. Some are going to pack it, right? So there's a, a little bit different response. Um, here's, I think this is one I, an image I saw when I was on vacation somewhere. Oh yeah, 
<laughs> this is closer to what you said. Instead of cookies, it's beer, but it's the same idea. More warning. So thinking about how warnings spread, you got to understand there's a, the original official warning, but there's other ways to get warnings. And we'll talk more about this, but the effectiveness of different types of warning systems, actually, the, as Dr. Maletti said, grandma's a, as good a warning system as anybody out there when it comes to contacting their family and, and getting people <coughs> moving. But another thing here is the, the telephone and thinking about the importance of telephone when it comes to warning, right? We all have this great little warning system in our, in our pockets now, but these great little warning systems can be turned off where the, your traditional landlines, you weren't, uh, weren't able to do that. And here shows a little bit how they've changed over time. Just uh, does anybody landline only at, at home? I'm gonna assume that's a no. Is it, do, how many of you don't have a landline at all? Okay, so that's one thing, right? Back in the day, you could just call somebody in the middle of the night and you were gonna wake them up because they couldn't, they weren't turning off or unplugging their land, landline. Today, it's a lot more difficult to wake people up in the middle of the night. You don't have that direct warning system and many people, you have these alerts, but a lot of people turn them on, off after they got woken up once in the middle of the night for something that had nothing to do with them. So, so that's, that's an issue and understanding how technology is changing and how it affects warnings is really important. Okay, so the evacuation. Okay, so a couple things here for me. Um, <clears throat> thought through this with my family. I have two kids and a wife um, and we have two vehicles. And I'm just trying to think, I don't think there's any way I'd say, all right, Honey, you get in there with one kid, I'll get in with the other house, one with the other kid, and hopefully I'll see you later, right? It's, we're all getting in one and we're all in this together. I don't want to get separated. So it's interesting that they took different vehicles, but some people are going to do that, and that's part of understanding why people do what they do. The other aspect is Woody's going to talk to you about um, modeling evacuation in life. So it's really cool, it's sophisticated, it does all sorts of good stuff. It's, you're still not going to be able to model human decision making, right? It's, it's a model. It goes back to understanding all, all models are useful but flawed. So make sure you understand that and be skeptical of the results when you see them. So evacuation, understanding what the evacuation is going to look like. Is it going to look like this where people are parked on freeways forever? Um, are you going to have good evacuation signs, good evacuation routing? Whether or not you believe the model, you're going to get a lot of good information out of that as <clears throat> that can help you with evacuation planning um, moving forward. So they made it out. Um, evac evacuation was successful. Um, but the last piece here is that shelter provided by the final location. Um, of their town, 133 of the 150 were gone. On the left here, you see New Orleans during Katrina, right? That was bad, but the houses were there. Many people were able to, to shelter in the houses. Um, that was a lot different than Katrina out on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi, where the surge 
wiped out those houses altogether, right? So understanding the depths, velocities, and the, the construction material and the shelter that's going to be provided is an important part of it. Fatality rates, so being exposed to certain things and likelihood of dying. There's a lot to read here. So two people exposed to the same flood conditions, one survived, one did. So when you start thinking about fatality rates for this group, that's a 50% fatality rate is how we would how we would use that in, in our modeling approaches. How many people died during the Teton Dam fire? 11 is the official. How many of those were direct versus indirect? That's where it gets interesting. Um, these are the people that died, but when you break it down to direct versus indirect, those are the ones that had that direct interaction with the flood. And then you have this indirect, which heart attack, accidental gunshot wound, when he was, there, he was evacuating, moving a, a gun in his car and accidentally shot himself. Uh, another heart attack, and then a self-inflicted gunshot wound afterwards, suicide from stress, right? Those are what we start, how we start talking about the, the indirect uh, impacts in life loss. And back to what was said earlier, by now, with all the research we've done on this that you'll hear about, that is really hard to get your, to wrap your arms around how many people might die from indirect um, impacts. Now let's go into each one of these in a little more detail and talk about how we uh, model them. So initial distribution of people, we need a, stru we need a structure inventory for the area of interest. Um, that structure inventory contains the location of the structures, number of stories, foundation height, occupancy type, and construction type help us. The construction type is important for the stability criteria. And occupancy type um, is important for understanding <coughs> whether it might be multi-family home or single-family home and distributing people in those structures. Population is really um, important key is you have the structure inventory, but you have to have people in there to, to get your life loss estimate and then value. Um, <clears throat> so there's different levels of structure inventory. So you can get some nice detailed ones, um, um, what you, like what you see here. We have something called the National Structure Inventory in the Corps of Engineers. We're really lucky that it's taken a bunch of nationally available data, data sources, um, plus some pr proprietary ones, and we've built a structure inventory across the nation that you can just go in and clip out and get a really good starting point in, in almost no time. Um, that's not available to everybody outside the Corps. Uh, some people, I know DWR has a different version of it that they have for the state of California. Um, but if you're doing a core project, um, you can obviously use it. But if you're just trying to get a rough life loss estimate, you can start with census data. Just get an idea of how many people live in the area that you're worried about, and that can help you with that very rough estimate, uh, order of magnitude, understanding what your, your life loss might be. The NSI is that National Structure Inventory. Um, NSI plus survey is where you go in and then you, mod you, you move the, this national structure inventory. You look at aerial photos and you move all those around and refine that national structure inventory to get something really detailed. Uh, redistribution through evacuation. Again, I'm going to hit this really hard tomorrow, but I'll, I'll talk about it briefly now. You see this warning and evacuation timeline from when the threat's detected to when the warning is issued uh, to when the warning is received and then when it, the protective action is initiated. So real quick on these, we break it into these three kind of delays. The warning delay time. So the emergency management agency has received this threat and they have certain processes they go through before they issue a warning. How much time do they take, right? The goal here is let's shorten this timeline as much as possible. That's how you get more people out before the water shows up. So then once the warning is issued, um, there's a delay be between when it is issued and when people receive it, right? Just because you flip a switch on your siren doesn't mean everybody's heard it in the area you're trying to issue the warning. And then like we saw for Teton, once somebody receives a warning, everybody responds slightly different. That's this protective action initiation time. 
what Dr. Maletti and Sorensen did for us was go through their knowledge of all the case histories and identified um, the primary factors that influence each of these delay times. And again, I'm gonna to touch on these a lot harder tomorrow. I'll go through these quickly now though. So for warning delay time, if you have a warning plan and those are written down, means you planned it, you're not just doing it ad hoc, it's gonna be shorter. Uh, you have warning thresholds in place where you thought through ahead of time, hey, if this is what I'm seeing, this is the warning I'm gonna send out. Uh, you've, you've practiced, so you don't just have the plan, but you've practiced it. Um, and you have clearly defined responsibilities. They also provided us with, hey, here's what it would look like. Based on our case histories, for those people that have are checked all those boxes and have a good plan and have practices, practiced it, it's probably going to be relatively short most likely somewhere in the 15 minute time frame but there's still a lot of uncertainty about this so this is where we start talking about uncertainty if we go and say this this group is really has a really good plan really well prepared we're going to assign this this really well pre prepared curve to them but there's still a chance it could take a long time there could something could go wrong so when you see stuff like this used in our process it's this Monte Carlo approach where we start sampling off of these curves and that's where you start to see the spread in your, your results because you could get some longer delays than you would expect. Uh, warning diffusion time is the, the number and mix of warning channels. So populations are diverse. You want to interact with them in diverse ways. Not everybody always picks up the phone. There's still some people that are listening to the radio, television, all of these different ways that you want to use them all. Um, repeat the warning um, and ability to wake people up, which is usually about what I need right now in this talk is the, the ability to wake people up. But um, like we talked about with the phone, it takes, you, you need to think about nighttime and think about ways to be able to wake people up in the middle of the night. What do you think an effective way of doing that is? Other than phones kind of. Sirens are about the best option, like downstream of them, but you have to have those pretty regularly spaced through a community um, for them to be effective. I mean, and embrace modern technologies. There's a bunch of new stuff out there. Embrace it. This is what a relationship for that would look like. These are kind of the bounds, like the worst case scenario on the bottom there, how long it takes for your population to get warned over time, and best case scenario, on the left in the green upper bound, how quickly, if everything is, is as efficient as possible. Last one is protective action initiation. This is all about the, the really the message content and style. And again, you have these ranges of best case scenario, worst case scenario, and, and a lot of stuff in between. So scalability. <clears throat> so we, I showed you all these curves. If you don't know anything about your downstream communities, then just use those curves with all the uncertainty in there and get a wide range of estimates for your life loss. That's okay. How do we refine that? Doctors Maletti and Sorensen went in and gave us an interview schedule that measures those factors that really matter. So we go talk to emergency managers. There's about 60 questions in there. Have that back and forth. We can translate that into basically a, a curve with still with some uncertainty, but less uncertainty than we had without any of that knowledge. So this is those different curves you go through, you, you would pick out what you're seeing here is after you've done that interview, now our range is much smaller than using that, that full wide range. Um, and same thing for protective action initiation. Okay, evacuation modeling. How do we model evacuation? Like I said, Woody's gonna talk about this more. It's really cool, but it uses the Department of Transportation um, traffic flow modeling where people slow down at higher density. It looks at the different types of roads, one lane, two lane. Um, the <clears throat> so all that's built into it one way or not, one, one direction. Um, and it turns into something like this. So this is what you see in life sim. All the yellow structures are people getting warning and then the blue are vehicles leaving those structures. They get on the road, moving through the road network starts to back up where the traffic density gets to be higher. Um, 
So, so that's what it looks like in practice. So when people lose their life during flood events and you see it on the news, what is that us what usually has happened? It's that turn around, don't drown. Lots of people really are trying to drive across something they shouldn't have driven across and get washed away. So if we want to talk about potential loss of life during a flood event, we should probably allow for people to drive into flooded water that they shouldn't really be driving into. So we actually have some research on where people set up cameras at flooded intersections and tried to figure out how many people were driving across and why. And we have some relationships um, out of that that are, show the probability of somebody entering a flooded road, trying to cross a flooded road, um, and that's a relationship of, of depth in that road. So built into life sim is the ability for people to drive into the road that they sh shouldn't be. We also have this vertical evacuation. <clears throat> so again, we have an idea for the different types of structures, how tall they are, one story, two story, three story buildings. Um, so first thing we do is we look to see if they can evacuate above the top floor and that's based on whether or not they're identified as having limited mobility. So you can go through your census data, you can go through um, a lot of that information and get an idea of the percentage of people with limited mobility. I think about my aunt and uncle that are in wheelchairs, right? They're, they're not going to be climbing into their attic or onto their roof um, if they're asked to evacuate or if they're trying to escape the floodwaters. They'd be able to get to the top floor in their building, um, but not above that. So <clears throat> if they can't evacuate beyond the top floor, then they're stuck at that top floor. If they can, then we did redistrib redistribute them either into the attic or onto the roof. Right? If that was me, water's coming, I'm trapped in the house, I'm going to get either into the attic or on the roof one way or the other. So that's how we talk about vert vertical evacuation in our process. Again, you can scale this. A lot of times you'll see people that do a, even a life sim study where they don't want to do model the evacuation because it takes time to get that road network really connected correctly. You got to think through it. You got to run some tests on it. Say, hey, let's just make a basic assumption of if they leave their structure, they're going to be safe. If they leave it before the water gets there. That's, that's a safe assumption. Sure, it's going to be a, off in many cases, especially if you have a lot of traffic density and a fast moving uh, flood. But in many cases, that's going to be fine. A lot of times people leave and if they left, they're going to be safe. Um, but if you really want to scale it up, that's when you do that detailed evacuation. Um, and then for vertical, you can assume the most common structure, like a one story residential and assume everybody's able to body. You're going to have an estimate on the low. That's not a conservative estimate. You're going to be a little low there, but it's a, at least you can get an initial start. Um, and then you can do a much more detailed assessment based on the, the attributes. Severity of flooding. Um, this is where, if you're familiar with something like HCC RAS, you do a breach analysis. And the severity is all about the depths and velocities, arrival time, and extents. That's what we're looking for when we're talking about flood severity. Um, some important concepts for inundation modeling. You have to understand the scenario, the pool or stage elevation, <clears throat> and the inflows, breach or non-breach. And failure mode can really matter when it comes to that warning timeline like I talked about earlier. Understanding the breach parameters can make a big difference um, in your inundation. Whether you're doing 1D or 2D, when is it appropriate to do one-dimensional modeling or two-dimensional modeling? If you need depth, velocities, and arrival time behind a levied area, or behind a levee in a flat levied area, you probably need to do two-dimensional modeling to get any, modeling to get that kind of information. Um, initial conditions and incremental inc coincident flows are important. Um, for example, 
what you see here is Orville Dam up there. Um, and this is an inundation modeling that we did. But the city of Sacramento is down here to the right, hard to see. The city of Sacramento has over a million people in it. Um, <clears throat> and whether or not this breach at Orville Dam led to overtopping and flooding in Sacramento all depended on what we assumed was going on in the rivers prior to that breach. So the American River in Folsom also goes, flows through Sacramento. If we assume there's large releases coming out of there, then the breach of Oroville Dam, this scenario overwhelms those levees and everybody in Sacramento gets flooded. If not, they don't. So that's a big difference. And so it's important to understand what you're thinking about and what your assumptions are on those coincident inflows. Uh, for breach parameters, uh, I think the first thing you should think about is, does it matter? Do I need to do a lot of effort on breach parameters? Um, <clears throat> if you're talking about a dam and you don't have anybody directly downstream of that dam, and they're, in this case, 10 miles downstream, the difference in those hydrographs, the timings, the depths, not that big a difference compared to right downstream, right? You have enough time for that flood wave to attenuate. Those different breach parameters didn't make that big a difference, so don't spend a lot of time trying to refine them. We've seen this, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to just touch on it again real quick. But when you're talking about breach parameters for dams, understanding what those breach parameters mean is really important. Um, so back to this, the breach initiation time, that's not something you put into your HEC RAS model, right? When you start talking about your breach formation time, um, that is very specific to collapse of the embankment and full breach. So those traditional empirical formulas, the McDonald, Frolic, Pontoon and Gillette, all those are focused on that aspect of the breach. You, you need to know that when you're building these um, breach models and tying them to your, to your warning timelines. Um, we've seen this. Okay. <clears throat> So the imminent hazard identification period, understanding the idea of when somebody might identify that they have an imminent hazard occurring could be anywhere from when that failure mode initiated to well after the dam breach, right? It could be that dam not monitored out in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows it breached until somebody 100 miles downstream sees a flood wave coming, right? That could be well after. So. Start by understanding, here's my time period, um, <clears throat> and then start building in the, the rest of that timeline, your hazard communication and warning delay. So the difference between when you knew the dam would fail and when the warning was issued, and then you see the rest of that timeline play out from there. So again, this is back to connecting those two components. Um, and again, the scalability here for inundation modeling is you can do a generic set of scenarios or you can do very specific failure mode specific scenarios. After you've done, gone and done a PFMA, identified your risk drivers, you can tie your consequences specifically to those. People in a structure that can withstand the flooding. So the concepts we need to cross here are really low hazard and high hazard. Low hazard is exposed to relatively calm floodwaters where the stability of shelters are not at risk. Hazard exists because people are coming into contact with water where that interaction is not designed to exist. So there's still a hazard there, um, but people aren't getting washed away. We see it all the time, people evacuating through floodwaters and, and generally safe. High hazard is different where stability criteria is exceeded and people are getting washed away and it really comes up to luck as to whether or not they survive. So conceptually, our whole goal here is to step through all of these components and say, all right, this is how many people end up in a high hazard of our exposed population. This is how many are in the high hazard. This are how many are in the low hazard. So Stephanie's going to talk about this a lot more this afternoon, um, but just for the purposes of this workshop, I'll, I'll cover it briefly. We have all these relationships that talk about, all right, if your depths and velocities combined are above this up here, um, you're in the high hazard zone, you're, you're going to get washed away. If they're lower in the green area, low hazard, not going to get washed away. And this is for a high clearance, so an SUV or truck. 
Um, and then there's that zone of uncertainty, right? Everybody has different stuff in the back. Tires are up slightly different, so they're not all exactly the same. So we sample somewhere in there for each, each vehicle that gets caught in the water, we sample a slightly different stability criteria. But that's how we decide whether to put them in a high hazard or low hazard um, zone. Again, back to the scalability, you can make some basic assumptions to get a rough estimate, or you can go in and do that very specific criteria if you have the, all the information. Will people exposed to flooding die? So back to those fatality rates. This says new life sum fatality rates. They're not that new anymore. We've had them for a couple of years. We had, again, we had teams sit down and just comb through the historic record, everything we could find about people being exposed to flood waters and whether they lived or died. So every dot that you can kind of see, but what you see there is a, is a bunch of dots, represents a specific person or a group of people that were exposed to flood waters. Um, so this is zooming in. So the, the low hazard, it looks like it's basically all zeros, but then spikes near one. This is zooming in close to zero there. So we are seeing low hazard life loss. So for example, this was during Harvey. Uh, they were way, walking through the floodwaters um, and somebody stepped on a live electrical wire and he was with somebody else. The other person didn't step on it, he did. That's how you come up with a fatality rate of 50% in a low hazard area, just that accident of getting electrocuted. Similarly, other people evacuating, one person fell into, a, fell into a ditch and drowned and the others survived. High hazard examples, um, I don't know, maybe some of you remember this vehicle full of soldiers um, got washed away. Nine of the 12 soldiers died. So that's how you come up with that fatality rate of 75%. The Galveston hurricane back in 1900, this is really depressing. A lot of these are really depressing, um, but a lot of nuns were trying to evacuate um, a, a bunch of orphans, tied them all together to, so they didn't get lost. And the only ones that survived are the couple that didn't get tied on with everybody else, right? So that's how you end up with a really high fatality rate for that group. It's important to know even under high hazard conditions, you can still end up with life loss of zero. I'll talk about Tom Sock more on Thursday, but everybody got washed away middle of the night and they all survived. So it can happen. We need to recognize that. Okay, last piece, potential for indirect life loss. Again, direct flood fatality is when a person directly interacts with the flood or their structure or their, their vehicle. Um, indirect is because of flood fatality can occur just because of the major disaster that's going on. Um, you can see it here, but it's stress induced, um, power related, or exposure to extreme temperatures that you wouldn't have been otherwise. Does it matter? <clears throat> it really can, especially for the really large regional events. These are storm related reports uh, for 59 tropical cyclones. Um, and we, sh they showed that it's about half of the life loss that's attributed to those is because of the indirect impacts. Um, <clears throat> mostly with loss of electricity, cardiovascular failure, evacuation and vehicle accidents, but really it's that power availability is key. When we talk about vehicle accidents, it's not people evacuating in a panic and running into each other. It's people evacuating and the road network has been messed up. There's power lines down, there's, there's trees in the way. That's that kind of a issue that leads to, to life loss. But it really, that's that electricity is key. If you lose power over a large area and you have a, a storm that's cold or hot coming through, it leads to all sorts of, sorts of problems. Another way to think through the concept of indirect life loss is this timeline, right? During the flood, you're going to have drowning, collapse of structure. That's the direct life loss. Um, but you'll also have accidents. And even before the flood, you see a lot of people losing their life because they're prepping for the flood. 
to come. <clears throat> then you have short term afterwards, you have the exposure, medical conditions and stress. Um, but then there's this long term one that's even more difficult than the other stuff we're talking about to try to capture like famine, disease, and again, the stress, medical, and political unrest. But an example of this is um, when we talk to you about, hey, here's a rough way to estimate order magnitude indirect life loss, which we'll talk to you about later this week. We're not even trying to capture that, those long-term, <coughs> like years out. An example of that is Bankyao Dam. Failed in China in the 70s, um, 26,000 direct, over 200,000 indirect life loss, and that was all famine and disease related. And trying to capture that is, is just really difficult. So for those type of things, we like to talk about it qualitatively. Hey, here's what we think direct is. Here's a rough estimate of indirect, at least in the, the flood in short term. And here's some things that could happen long term that would even make that indirect. A lot of partial. Uncertainty, here's an example of what you'll see from a life sim simulation where you do Monte Carlo and you get for each one of those dots represents a different simulation of the entire event and life loss estimate associated with it. And you can see the spread there and start understanding, all right, what's leading to this spread? What's, what are, what's driving my uncertainty? Um, and there's, there's another way to look at it, just your, your mean and, and your max and min and spread. So. <clears throat> Stephanie will talk about this a lot more, but embrace it. Understand that if you're talking about life loss, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. You need to be able to, to talk about it. Don't shy away from it. Okay, I talked about uh, the reclamation approach, estimating life loss. It used to be DS, DSO 9906. Now it's called the reclamation consequence estimation method. We don't use it, um, and there's a couple reasons why. Um, it's built on a <coughs> limited, non-representative sample. The RSM approach is an empirical approach that's looked at case histories and said, okay, this dam failure, this is how many people died from that dam failure. It lumps together a bunch of the important aspects of it, but it's, for the core, when we started this, we were saying, well, luckily, there haven't been a bunch of dam failures in the past that are similar to a typical Army Corps of Engineers dam, which has a bunch of, a lot of ours have large populations right downstream because a lot of ours are flood control dams, right? And we haven't seen a lot of those. So using an empirical approach doesn't make any sense if the data that that's built on isn't representative of, of, the met, of what you're trying to, to estimate. Um, <clears throat> but it also, um, We've talked about how much warning has changed in the last 15 years, much less the last 100 years. So if you're trying to build in the idea of how many people might evacuate and you're using dam failures from, from the early 1900s to, to help you understand that, you're, you're probably missing some important factors. So that's another reason. Um, <clears throat> I already talked about warning and evacuation is lumped in with the, the other parameters. They don't take that separately. They don't look at shelter survivability, so the difference between concrete buildings and, and mobile homes, there's, there's no difference there. And they use large scale averages. So for a given flood event, there often there'll be one, maybe two, so one representative depth time velocity that talks about the, the overall um, <clears throat> flood dynamics. And that's, there's so much uncertainty there and coming up with one representative depth and velocity. It, it's, it's not scalable. It doesn't allow us to really get into the details that we want to, to be able to justify some of these estimates. Um, and it comes down to, it's not really conducive to risk management because if risk management involves consequence management, you need to be able to understand all the factors that you can adjust to reduce the potential consequences during an event like this. Okay. Just because life sim methodology is great doesn't mean it doesn't have some weaknesses, so we'll point those out. Um, <clears throat> again, it's a model. It's complex. We're simplifying. That's any model. Um, there's no direct consideration of prolonged exposure or rescue. We'll see in some other um, case histories later this week how important 
this can be. So you gotta understand, we don't have that built in. No spatial correlation of warning. So there's some stuff we're trying to do to better correlate how warnings go out, but um, right now it's just gonna randomly spread over an area and doesn't really capture maybe how some of your tighter knit societies go around warning each other in their neighborhood, something like that. We don't have any of that built in. Um, it doesn't have any indirect life loss built in. We have a separate method for that um, that we'll talk about. There's no explicit consideration of water temperature or debris. Those are all built into the fatality rates, right? Each one of those fatality rates, case histories we look at, had different temperatures and debris associated with those, but we don't have anything that says, all right, for really low temperatures, you should adjust your fatality rates one direction or another. It's all lumped together. Everybody pay attention to this one. It does not capture all the uncertainties that are out there when it comes to estimating loss of life. If you're using LifeSim, <coughs> you feed in one um, inundation event, one scenario. So if you have a, if you're concerned about breach parameters and the differences it, it's gonna make you have to say, all right, here's my best case and worst case and model those separate in life sim and do all that uncertainty on your own. It's not doing it for you, right? So we don't currently have a really nice way to, to add in the hydraulic uncertainty on top of all these other uncertainties. That's kind of a manual approach. <clears throat> really what it comes down to is estimate how many people will be in the path of the flood, how many of those are gonna end up in the high hazard, how many low hazard, apply the appropriate fatality rates, and then include in consideration of indirect life loss. Okay, um, so with that, thank you all for hanging in there.